So far in this series, we have been through the first six chapters of Romans, and just a, a, a quick summary of what Paul has been uh, saying is through chapters one through five, he's really driving the point home saying, listen, we are justified by faith. We are made right with God, not by what we do, but by what we believe. Uh, it's our faith in Jesus that puts us in right standing with God, no matter what we've done. And that's great news, and that's the foundation of the gospel. Last week in chapter 6, Paul says, so what now? Do we just keep on sinning so that grace can keep on working? And the answer is a resounding, of course not. We, we don't take you know, grace for granted and just keep sinning. We, we take grace as a free gift, and we let uh, God use this to empower us to live an overcoming life, a life that honors God. So then we live happily ever after in a victorious life, never struggling again, right? Wrong. There, there's still struggle in this life. And, and chapter 7, if you read 6 and 7, can seem to be, and it's not, and we're going to look at why it's not, can seem to be a contradiction because Paul in chapter 6 has been saying, we're overcomers. He says, we're dead to the old life. We talked about it last week. And then in chapter 7, all of a sudden, we see the struggle again. And there's a tension there. And that's what today is going to be all about. Chapter 7 is an amazing chapter that I think could set you free today. And so we're just going to be believing that God's going to speak to us today. Come on, how many are expectant to get a word from God? All right, three of you. It's good. Just kidding. Um, so we're going to be in chapter 7, verse 4. I'm going to pray before we read. God, we thank you for your word. And we read it today with open hearts, expecting to hear from you, not Josh, but God, from you. And we want to hear your words, Holy Spirit. And, and we want them to, to change us uh, into, into, into the people that you've called us to be. We want to walk out of the doors today. We, we want to finish hearing this today and be better than when it started. God, that, that is our prayer. So we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for your presence. We're thankful for church. We're thankful for community. God, and we're thankful for the Redskins. God, we pray for a miracle this year and a Super Bowl victory in February of 2020. God, we're just believing for the impossible in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, this is what Paul says in... We're going to start in verse 4. So, my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ. And now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. This is his summary, really, of all of chapter 6 and the beginning of chapter 7. He's saying that that old way of living, which was by the law, is dead. And now you have a new nature. He's summarizing it, saying all of that is gone. The law only applied when that old self was alive, but now that your old self has been crucified with Christ, the law has been fulfilled. That's the point. Now, throughout this whole chapter, it's important to note that Paul is addressing, and he says it in verse 1, which we skipped, he's addressing those that were familiar with the law. He, he's basically, in chapter 7, going to be talking about all right, if we've got this new life and, and we're made right with God through our faith and, and, and the grace of God that makes us right with God also empowers us to live this new life, then what about the law? Where does the law fit into the equation then? Is it just done? Was it evil? So that's what this is all about. He says the point is you died to your old life. You've got a new life now. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. When we were controlled by our sinful nature, by our old nature, sinful desires were at work within us, and the law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds resulting in death. That's crazy right there, and that's really key for the rest of today. He says the law aroused the evil desires. Verse 6, but now we have been released from the law, for we died to it and are no longer captive to its power. That would be a good place for an amen. Now we can serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the Spirit. How awesome is that? My son Roman is six, and he just tried out for 
a, a, a travel football, flag football team, and um, he, he loves football. He got all of my competitive nature, he, and he's really good, and he got asked to be on this older travel team or to, co- to come try out for it at the first practice, and so he got really excited, and uh, we were gearing up for the first practice, and he's, he's really wanting to make it, and he knows that the kid, all the kids are going to be older than him, and he's scared that he's going to get cut, and I'm telling him, Roman, it doesn't matter, man. Like, you're, you're so young. Just the fact that you got invited is an honor, and so it's a big deal leading up to it. We go to practice. Long story short, he ends up making it, which was cool. We get home, and, and he goes, Daddy, uh, so I really made it? I said, yeah, buddy, you really made it. And he goes, so is next practice going to be another tryout? And I said, no, the tryout is done. You're on the team. And he goes, so I can just have fun? I said, yeah, buddy. It was so cute. I said, you can just have fun at practice now and play, not worry about getting cut. Come on, everybody. This is how the new life is. You don't have to worry about getting cut. You don't have to worry about getting judged. Come on, we get to live a free life under the grace of God, empowered by the Spirit of God. We get to live in the freedom. Well, you don't have to worry about every little thing, wondering if you're going to make God mad, wondering if you're going to send yourself to hell. We live under the grace of God, and that's the good news today. Come on, that's good news. And, and, and so I'm going to skip some verses. We're going to come back and, and fill in this gap and read them in a little bit. But I'm going to go to verse 14. As Paul continues this thought, he says, So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. Now, if you pause right there. And if you've been paying attention, come on, just act like you've been paying attention and and act really concerned because if you've been paying attention, it seems like a contradiction to everything we just talked about last week. When Paul literally said in in chapter 6, verse 6, we are no longer slaves to sin. So wait a second. We just, he, he just, now, now he's saying, I'm a slave to sin. Wait, I just thought you said that we're no longer. And, and this issue between chapter six and seven actually has scholars and commentators divided. They say, is Paul talking as his old self, pre conversion? Or is Paul struggling as his new self, post conversion? Like, like who, who is Paul? What, when did he write it? What, what is he referring to when he writes it? And, and the point is, Like, we're not God, and some things, I think the best theology is sometimes to say, I don't know. But what is the essence of what he is saying? What is God really trying to show us? And I think here's what we can get from this today is... I don't know whether it was pre-conversion or post-conversion, but I know that, that even when we're saved, there can still be a struggle. And I know this, that all of chapter 7, you must realize this, for those of you who are scholarly and and really study the Bible, you must realize as you are reading chapter 7 that chapter 7 is talking about and explaining the law. And so what Paul is talking about in this whole chapter is what life is like when you try to live it adhering to the law. It's, listen, all of chapter 7, you've got to listen through this context today. Paul is trying to explain the whole chapter is about the law. And so his whole point is, this is what it's like when you rely on the law. You take Jesus out of the equation, and it's me and the law, or me and my good works, or me and good intentions. This is what's going to happen. So are you on the same page with me? This is through the context. This is me. He says, I I, in in and of myself, ego is the word. It literally is the word. I am a slave to sin. When Jesus is not in the equation, sin is powerful. If it's you versus sin, by yourself in your own power, you lose. If it's you versus the devil, you, only with your own power, you lose in your own power. But how many know, wait, there's more. So this is through that lens, through that context, we must keep reading This is the misery that it leads us to without Jesus. Paul says, I don't understand myself. For I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, then this shows that I agree that the law is good. He's saying, I know, I'm not like happy about doing the wrong thing. I know that it's wrong. He's saying, that's proof that I that I think that the ways of God is the right way to live. Right? So he's. Anybody feel like I'm reading your mail right now? You're like, are you reading about me? No, we're, this, is, this should make you feel better if you live in a struggle. Sometimes you feel like you don't know yourself. 
I thought I was like doing good. I, I thought I was a Christian. I was been going to church and I'm just like, I'm in this struggle. This is Paul. Paul so I'm, I'm not the one doing wrong. It's sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. See, there's another key for understanding chapter seven. He's not saying in me and my new nature. He, he literally says in verse 18, nothing good lives in me. And he clarifies that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't, I, 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 I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing it. It is sin living in me that does it. Paul, what's going on? You sound like a crazy man. Come on, you can relate. If you've ever been struggling, you can relate with Paul right now. He says, I've discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all of my heart, but there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. I think everybody needs to say a big resounding thank God together. Come on, let's all say it. Thank God. Come on, say it again. Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Come on, let's give God a shout of praise in this place. We have the solution. We have the answer. Even though there's a struggle, we know the solution. The solution is Jesus Christ. The solution is Jesus Christ. So you, so you see, he says, it, in my mind, I really want to obey, but because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. This is the struggle I think that everybody, if you're honest, can relate to on some level or another. Has anybody ever shopped at Ikea? Come on, let me see a show of hands if you've ever shopped at Ikea. Yeah, about half of you. Let me talk to the other half of you for a minute. <laughs> this is what happens. You go to this big, huge Swedish wonderland, and you're walking through the store, and you see really modern, cool furniture, and then you see the price tag, and you're going, this is too good to be true. This is incredible. This is amazing. I love that couch, and look how cheap that couch is. I love this dresser, so stylish, and look how cheap that dresser is. And you just get so excited, and you're just taking down all the tags and all the numbers, and you can't wait to get down to the warehouse, and you load your cart up with stuff, and you put it in your car, and you tie it down with a little twine, and you're so excited to get home and, and to set it all up, and you get home, and you open the box, and it looks like something exploded in the box. It's a million pieces. A million pieces. And you realize it is too good to be true. This is going to take me a year to set up. And my wife and I, when we got our first place together after we got married, we, we went to Ikea and we loaded up because you can afford to do that at Ikea. And we got all of our dressers. And I mean, I, I, I was like, I was excited. I don't know why I was excited. Here's the tip. When you put a dresser on the cart down at the warehouse and the box is this wide. <laughs> I mean, it's this tall. It's, a, it's about that tall. It's about that deep, six feet deep. And it's this wide. How does that dresser fit in that box? I never thought that. I was just excited because of the price tag. I should have put two and two together. <laughs> Nothing is put together. The whole thing's disassembled. You want the drawers to slide? You better install the rails and the ball bearings and the little wheels. And, and so I get home and I open the box and I was massively depressed. And to make matters worse, the instructions were impossible. There's just pictures and there's this little stick figure that looks really happy and makes it look really easy. And this little stick figure has become popular because everybody wants to punch him in the face. Because it's not that easy. I don't know how to do that. You didn't tell me that that screw was the one. You, it was the other screw. And now I don't have that screw because three steps ago, I already screwed in all the wrong screws into the stupid hole. Now I got to go back. And anyway, I set up our first dresser. 
It took me six months, and when I got done, I, I was so excited. It was laying on its, it was, it's, it's this really nice, like, uh, you know, ebony dresser, and, and it's this, like, really nice dark wood. We were so excited, and Brittany was excited, and it's laying down on its face. I finished putting the last leg on, and I lift it up, and I'm like, Britt, look. And she's like, why is that white piece of wood right there across the front? And I looked at it. And I cussed a little bit in my head. <laughs> and, I, and then I was like, I installed that on step three. And there was 33 steps. We're going to find some paint that matches this thing because <laughs> it didn't tell me which side to face out on that panel. I hate Ikea. And if I could punch this little stick figure in the face, I'd punch him in the face. I'd punch a hole in the wall, but I wouldn't be able to repair it because I don't have any money left. I spent it all at Ikea. <laughs> just left with the instructions, and I don't have any clue what to do. And that's how it is with the law. you just left with instructions, and we don't have any clue how to do it. It's like this is impossible to do. Here's the crazy thing about Jesus. Jesus is like as if the stick figure man came off the page and built the dresser himself. This is the gospel, that the instructor comes off of the pages of the law and he fulfills the law that we couldn't fulfill. He follows the instructions that we couldn't follow. He takes the penalty for us not following this law. He dies the death that we should have died. And then he says, here's a free pass. Here's the dresser. Here's the life that you couldn't live up to. It's the free gift of grace. John 1 chapter, John chapter 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. In fact, the Word was God. And it goes on to say that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The instructions dwelt among us. The law dwelt among us. It's all about Jesus. Jesus has done it. Jesus breaks the cycle of sin and shame and death. Jesus fulfills the law. It's all about Jesus. And so the message today is called Stick Figure Jesus. Come on, turn to somebody next to you and say stick figure Jesus. He came off the page. He came out of the instructions and he set it all straight for us. Chapter seven is like, chapter seven is like a big loud shout from Paul that life without Jesus is a, is a constant struggle. The fight for Christians, the fight for, for those of us familiar with God's word, familiar with the law of God. He says in verse 1 of chapter 7, we didn't read it, he says, for those of you familiar with the law, that's who this is geared to. So church today, for those of you familiar with the, the commands of God, with the ways of God, all of chapter 7 is saying it's a fight to live in grace. It's a fight. If you try to rely on the law, it's going to be miserable. Paul would say this, he would say, the same way that we come into the, our faith is the same way that we should continue in it. Chapter 7 is a picture of what it looks like if you try to come into the faith through the free gift of grace, but then try to continue in the law. It's not going to work. Because I, without Jesus, am a torn person. And may I go as far to say as I'm a tormented person. Because I have a new nature but I have this corpse that's still trying to hold on to me. And although it's dead, I'm still trying to shed it. And until the day that I meet Jesus face to face, I live in this life that still has temptation and sin in it. And so it's a fight to, it's a fight to let Jesus keep control. And, and I pray that over the next few minutes as we look through this passage that, that we can break it down and it'll make, it'll make sense to you today. In chapter 7, God can speak to you through this passage. And so three points that I believe capture the thought that Paul is, is giving us today. The first one is this, the law isn't bad. Sin is. And it's really important uh, point. And, and, and hopefully over the next couple of minutes, I'll show you why it matters to you. Paul starts off by saying to those of you familiar with the law. So you have to understand that Paul's audience that he's writing to includes 
these Christians in Rome, it includes Jewish people who were familiar with the law of Moses and this, knew that this law sustained their ancestors. This was the covenant for years and years and years, generation after generation. They knew that the law wasn't bad. And so if Paul goes and just starts dogging the law, talking bad about the law, he knows that his message is going to fall on deaf ears. And so what he's doing is he's validating that the law of God is good. And so how does that relate to us today? The ways of God, living a life that follows the ways of God. For example, the Ten Commandments. I mean, if you break the Ten Commandments, God can still forgive you because of the grace of God. That's the amazing part of the gospel. But that doesn't mean that the Ten Commandments are bad and that we should break them. I mean, the law of God, the ways of God are good. And what Paul is saying is it's important that you understand that. that God's ways... God's law that he set in place as the old covenant is good. It's not bad, but sin is bad. And what you're going to see in a minute is that sin, it's as if sin took us hostage and held the law to our head as if a hostage was being held at gunpoint. And sin manipulated the law for its own use. To entice us to commit sin and then shame us for the sin and ultimately punish us with death because of our sin. Sin is the dirty problem. The law was good. And I'll show you what I mean. In in verse 7, we skip this part and I'm going to read this now. Paul says, well then am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Well, of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said, you must not covet. But watch this part. This is crazy. This is in your Bible. But sin used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. Listen to this. All kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have had that power. At one time, I lived without understanding of the law. But, but when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came to life, and I died. So I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me. But still, the law itself is holy, and its commands are holy and right and good. But how can that be? Did the law, which is good, cause my death? He says, of course not. Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death. So we can see how terrible sin really is. It uses God's good commands for its own evil purposes. Isn't that crazy? The word we're talking about right now, everybody, is rebellion. You know, there's that one story about how there was a pond that nobody fished in. As soon as they put up the sign that said no fishing in this pond, everybody started fishing in the pond. Why? Because there's sin in us. And it takes the law and it entices us to do the very thing we're not supposed to do. Come on, it'll be good. Come on, it's not that bad. And then you do it. And then, bam, sin slams the law back on top of us and shames us for doing the very thing it just tempted us to do. Sound familiar? Don't nod your head. Somebody might judge you. Just nod your head later, as I say. You know, you just agree with me later, and then nobody will see you nodding, and they won't think that you're a bad person. I'm just kidding. Which leads me to point number two. Me plus good intentions equals misery. Uh, Because Jesus is not in that equation. Me with good intentions to follow the law, oh, that's not a good combination, because guess what? There's sin creeping at our door. There's sin which has ulterior motives. There's, there's a sinful nature in us. And, and when we don't let Jesus, we don't, when we don't rest in the finished work of Jesus, when it's me and I'm trying to do better, you're toast. Come on, that's going to help you today. When it's you and, but I want to turn over a new leaf, you're going to live a miserable life. It's me and I've been going to church lately. I'm trying to do some better things with my life. Get ready for a struggle. When, it, when it's me and, yeah, I've, I, I've really tried to leave some old things behind and I'm really doing better with myself. Get ready for a tormenting life. Because in that equation, it's you and your good intentions. 
And you're like, Paul, you're saying, I don't know what's wrong though. I love God's law with all my heart. Paul says, I love God's law with all my heart. I want you to identify with Paul today. I, I, I love, I want to do good with all my heart. I'm trying my very, very best. Verse 22, that's, that's what he says. And then watch how quickly, watch how quickly it goes bad. I love God's law with all my heart. If there's another power within me that's at war with my mind, this power makes me a slave to the sin that's still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. I have great intentions, but I'm miserable. It's like, it's like the good intentions almost make it even worse. It's, that's what the law, that's what sin does with the law. I'll prove to you what I'm saying with a really practical example. How many people break your New Year's resolution every year before March? <laughs> and, then, and then you never want to hear about that thing that was your resolution ever again. Because it's a sore spot for you. Like, like I, I was going to go to the gym, and I bought a gym membership, and I never went. Now you, never, now you feel guilty every time you drive past that gym. It's worse than if you had never even tried. That's, that's, listen, that's the power of the law. That's the power of legalism. That's the power of religion is this is where you should be, but you can't. And now you should feel shame and guilt. And in fact, the wages of that sin and failure is death. The law can't do it in and of itself. But I am so thankful today that it doesn't end with the law, but it ends with Jesus. Because as Paul is, as, is, as the tension is, is building, and as all of this drama is escalating in this writing. It's like we can identify with Paul. He's going, what I want to do, I don't do. What I don't want to do, I do. My good intentions aren't good enough. There's a war in my mind. I feel like I'm going crazy. And then he asks the best question, who's going to save me? He doesn't even say what. He gets it right with the question, who? Because nothing can save you. The law is not good enough in and of itself. Although it's not bad, it's not enough. It's going to take a who, and the who is Jesus, who came off the pages of the instructions and built the dresser for me. He did it. And when you put Jesus into the equation, that's when it works. Me plus Jesus equals good works. Away with your good intentions. Like, Good job with your good intentions, but loving God's law with all of your heart is not enough. Jesus, Jesus. Come on, what are you preaching about today, Josh? What is the answer in chapter seven? Jesus. Come on, everybody say Jesus. The name above every other name. The name of Jesus. The one that at every knee will bow at the sound of his name. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's all about Jesus. What is the solution? Jesus. What is the answer? Jesus. How do I overcome this tormenting struggle? Jesus. The answer is Jesus. The finished work of Jesus. Come on, at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to do it on your own. It takes Jesus. And back to the very beginning, the first verse that we read at the beginning of our reading said, you died to the power of the law. You are united with the one, that's Jesus, who was raised from the dead. And as a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. How can we go from this condemnation and this, this misery and this, this tormenting struggle to producing good deeds for God? How? How do we do it? Jesus. It's not by trying harder. And I know it's so, I, I would hear, like, we've been a church that has preached the gospel for a long time and the grace of God, and sometimes you hear it and you go, what do you mean don't try harder? Like, I, I need to try harder. It's not working. Well, you, you try and you glorify God, but it's out of this place of rest, not out of a place of needing to earn God's approval. It's like he already made you approved. But you believe in Jesus, you're approved. And what this does, watch this, and this is how I'll close. What this does is it comes in and it disrupts, it interrupts, it, it breaks the cycle of sin, shame, and death. Okay, so the cycle was, the cycle was the law 
entices you to sin because it arouses the evil desires within you. The sin uses that to cause that rebellion in you. And so the very same thing that tempts you is then the same thing that says, but you can't follow the law. You should feel guilty and icky and ashamed. And in fact, you deserve to die and there's separation from God. And because of that, I feel so condemned and I feel so unworthy and I feel like it's never going to be enough that then I keep doing it and I feel more shame and I feel more separation. And then I keep doing it and then I feel more shame. And it's this vicious cycle where sin has you hostage and it's using the law to make your life miserable. And Jesus steps in backwards to front at the death and says, okay, here's what I'm going to do first. I'm going to die for you. And then I'm going to take your shame and your guilt away, which is going to do what? Entice you to live a life that glorifies God. He, he, he changes the whole thing. He breaks the whole cycle. You're not going to die for your sin. That's just the sheer mercy of God. Well, thank you, God. I don't deserve that. Yeah, exactly. Don't feel any shame anymore because that's not you anymore. I've given you a brand new life. Man, how is that? How can that be? I, that is too good to be true. Yeah, doesn't that entice you to live a life that glorifies me? Yeah, it's a life that produces good works. And when people see our good works, they glorify our Father in heaven. Well, this is what Je you can clap for that. That's what Jesus does. The answer is in Christ Jesus. I want you to stand to your feet. And before I pray, I want to show you that this, this is where Paul ends it. But how many know the Bible doesn't have chapters? The this is, chapters are there for our benefit. And, and so Paul, I'm going to just give you a glimpse into next week as we move into chapter 8. So Paul goes, so listen, so, so now, therefore, because of all this, therefore, there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. What, what do I want you to leave with today? What is our takeaway from chapter 7, church? Sir, ma'am, student, you guys, listen, listen, listen. What's the takeaway? What's the takeaway? There's no condemnation. There's, there's no shame. None. Therefore, now, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. What is the answer to the struggle? What is the answer to this tormenting struggle where I, I feel torn and I want to do the right thing? The answer there's no condemnation in it all. There's no shame. Jesus has made a way. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. If you're here today and you're experiencing the weight of shame and the, the struggle of sin and not feeling like you can't get it right or you get it right one day and not the other, let, let Jesus break the cycle that's going on in your spirit. Say, shame off of you. Shame off you. I've paid the price. You are in right standing with God because of the grace of God. That old you is dead. Don't let it come back. Don't let the old mindset come back. Don't let the legalism come back. You're not living under the power of the law. For as verse 1 says, the law is only applies to those that are alive. And that old you that was under the law is dead. So you are released from the law. Live in the grace of God. Romans says, so I can have fun at practice now? Yeah, buddy. Listen, everybody. So I can, I can enjoy my Christian life now? Yes. You can enjoy it knowing that your imperfections are covered. His grace is good enough. We live in the, in the grace of God. It's freedom. What does that do, though? Entices us to live a life that glorifies him. God, I pray for every person here that's struggling with condemnation and shame. Let it lift off of them like a weight off of their shoulders in the mighty name of Jesus. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, even a physical weight on their chest or on their shoulders that they are carrying because of the sins that they've committed, let it be lifted right now. Let miracles happen in this place, God. Let the heaviness be lifted. God, let the shame be erased, God. Let those that feel worthless see their worth in you, that you love them so much much that you came and gave your life. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Let us who follow you never turn back to the old way. Our good intentions mean nothing because they're not strong enough. God, we, we live in the grace. We rest in the finished work of the cross, and that's where, that's where our strength, that's where our motivation, that's where our perspective comes from. Give us turnaround moments today, Holy Spirit. Turnaround moments. Work in people's hearts. 
For those that don't know Jesus, in this moment, as we're about to lead in this prayer, let them be drawn to you, God, and to experience the forgiveness that only comes from you. Those that are far from you, those that, that, that aren't walking with you, let them be drawn into your family right now through the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed if you would.